Well, welcome everyone again to another audio lecture. Uh, today we're going to be talking about specifically the Council of Ephesus held in the year 431 AD, the 5th century during the Nestorian controversy, and how this relates to the issue of the papacy. Uh, specifically, it's because part of the background to the Council of Ephesus is the correspondence between St. Cyril of Alexandria and Pope Celestine, who was the Bishop of Rome during this time period. And many Roman Catholic apologists have appealed to the correspondence between these two figures as proof that the early church, and specifically Cyril of Alexandria, believed in the doctrine of the papacy as taught by Vatican I in the 19th century. So I will first examine the correspondence between Cyril and Celestine, and secondly, we will examine the presidency of the Council of Ephesus, referring to who presided over this council and what the overall council's mind was towards the Bishop of Rome. So, first of all, um, we have the correspondence between Cyril of Alexandria and Pope Celestine, and uh, in the letter of Pope Celestine to Cyril of Alexandria, he says some interesting things, which I'm going to quote here, and then we're going to dig into this. So, uh, Celestine says, and pay very close attention to what he says, Celestine says, if he, Nestorius, persists, an open sentence must be passed on him, and so, appropriating to yourself the authority of our see, and using our position, you shall with resolute severity carry out this sentence, that either he shall within ten days count from the day of your notice, condemn in writing this wicked assertion of his, or if he will not do, do this, he will know that he is in every way removed from our body. We have written the same to our brothers fellow and fellow bishops, John, Rufus, Juvenal, and Flavian. So our judgment about him, or rather the divine sentence of our Christ, may be known. That's found in Patrologia Latina, volume 77, column 80, if you want the exact quotation, or citation, I should say. And so there's two big things here. Is, uh, Celestine, speaking to Cyril, says, appropriating to yourself the authority of our see, referring to Rome. And so the issue is, is uh, Celestine believed that he, as the Bishop of Rome, possessed this form of authority. And he says that in, and by the next clause, he says, using our position, you shall with resolute severity carry out this sentence, meaning that he believed that the Bishop of Rome, at least at, at first glance, he believed that the Bishop of Rome in and of himself had the authority to excommunicate. And he refers to this later, and, and I read this, he refers to this as the divine sentence of Christ. Now, they, the Roman Catholic apologists often appeal to this as proof that the Bishop of Rome had universal jurisdiction at this time. But there are several reasons why this is not accurate and not honest to the historical context. First of all, it was not Celestine all by himself who condemned Nestorius. It was an entire synod at Rome. Cyril mentions this in his third letter to Nestorius. So Cyril of Alexandria said, Behold therefore how we, together with the Holy Synod, which met in great Rome, presided over by the most holy and most reverend brother and fellow minister, Celestine the bishop, also testify by this third letter to you, and counsel you to abstain from these mischievous and distorted dogmas. So those are Cyril of Alexandria's words. And he speaks that there is an entire synod at Rome. Now, now of course the issue in light of the papal canons, known as Dictus Papi, Canon 25 says, the Pope of Rome may depose and reinstate bishops without assembling a synod. And so if papal infallibility, or papal jurisdiction specifically, was the universal faith of the church this time, then why, then what reason would there even have been for Celestine to have held a whole synod at Rome to condemn Nestorius when he could have done it all by himself? The simple reason is, is because they did not, the mind of the church in that, at that time did not view the Bishop of Rome as having this type of authority to excommunicate bishops in and of himself from the universal church. Secondly, when the phrase that Celestine uses, he says, appropriating to yourself the authority of our see. The Latin word used there for authority is the word actoritas. That's very important because this word actually doesn't really carry the idea of ecclesiastical jurisdiction at all. Um, and specifically, Carla Pullman, uh, she wrote an essay in a book called Being Christian in Late Antiquity on the concept of actoritas. It was an essay called Christianity and Authority in Late Antiquity, the Transformation of the Concept of Actoritas. So, and on page 159 of this book, Being Christian in Late Antiquity, and Lord willing, I will put a description, a link to this book in the description below. 
Carla Pullman says, even if the etymology of auctoritas, meaning strengthening or augmenting, as being derived from the Latin agere, meaning to augment, increase, strengthen, or magnify, was not always present in the minds of those using the term, it is, it is, it is still crucial that, um, that auctoritas adds more weight to a person's status, statement, or action by eliciting decisive approval in others. Moreover, one has to distinguish it with potestas, which denotes magisterial power and control by virtue of an office, while actoritas, and that's the word the Celestine uses, while actoritas signifies the influence which is conceded voluntarily to a person, institution, or text. So, when Celestine appropriated his actoritas, his authority to serial, it was not in reference to, to jurisdictional power, or rather moral authority, i.e. approval in advance of the decision that Cyril would make concerning Nestorius and his status within the visible church. Now, some Roman Catholics have apo uh, apologists have responded to this issue, like Eric Ibarra, a well-known defender of the papacy, and I would argue probably the best defender of the papacy out there right now. He responded by citing Canon 5 of the Synod at Hippo in North Africa, which cites its full authority, its plenas auctoritas, as the basis for the validity of its judgments over certain cases in the church. Now, while this may be true in this one case, this is crushed by the enormous amount of evidence from contemporary Roman literature, which gives the exact same meaning for auctoritas that we are giving right now. Uh, one example would be in Marius Victorinus. Um, there's his explanations on the rhetoric of Cicero, well-known, uh, you know, uh, our teacher of rhetoric in the Roman Empire, and wrote on it. He wrote that book, Institutio Oratoria, on the ideal oratory, on the, on the ideal orator, I should say. And Marius Victorinus, using the term auctoritas, says authority is a more truthful, so authority, auctoritas, is a more truthful and honest argument, which one thinks one has to believe as if by necessity. So it's talking about being compelled, it's talking about moral authority, not jurisdictional authority. But to press this point even further, uh, Leo Donald Davis, in his book on the Seven Ecumenical Councils, page 211, cites a letter from Pope Galatius in which he's talking about the distinction, the distinction, etymologically speaking, between auctoritas and potestas, these two Latin words. And Leo Donald Davis, citing Galatius, says, The Pope wrote as well to Anastasius. These are Galatius' words. They are, quote, There are in fact two, August Emperor, by whom this world is originally governed, the consecrated authority, auctoritas, of bishops, and the royal power, potestas. So notice the distinction between auctoritas and potestas. Of these, the responsibility of the bishops is the more weighty, since even for the rulers of men, they will have to give account at the judgment seat of God. Here, and the Leo Davis speaking says, here Galatius assigns to bishops auctoritas, a term consecrated to Roman law and belonging to the ideal and moral sphere whose force was derived from tradition and public uh, opinion. To the emperor, potestas, the power granted to Roman magistrates for the carrying out of their executive duties during their term of office. So he clearly says here that auctoritas is distinct from jurisdictional authority, which if that was what um, Celestine was giving to Cyril, he would have used the Latin term potestas rather than auctoritas. So the basic idea of this is that the fact that Celestine uses auctoritas shows that he's in reference to moral authority, not potestas. Now, let's just grant that... Um, that this claim, let's just, even if we were to grant, excuse me, that um, Celestine excommunicated Nestorius all by himself, this still would not prove <clears throat> that he is that he has universal jurisdiction. It would not prove that the Roman bishop had universal jurisdiction, that this was the view of the church at this time. Uh, because we have other examples of, in church history, of bishops excommunicating people outside of their diocese. Uh, one example is John Chrysostom execute, or, <laughs> executed excommunicated several bishops in Asia, among whom was Gerontius, the bishop of Nicomedia. Sozomen, the ancient church historian, speaks of this in Book 8, Chapter 6 of his Ecclesiastical History. So if we're going to use the logic that Roman Catholic apologists use, then we must say that John Chrysostom, who was the patriarch of Constantinople at one point, had universal jurisdiction. But of course, they would not grant such a thing, especially not to Constantinople, with whom Rome split in 1054 AD. Now, the next issue that we should discuss is the presidency and the convocation of the Council of Ephesus, which of course was the culmination of one aspect of the Nestorian controversy, though 
This was more fully elaborated at the Council of Chalcedon 20 years later in 451 AD. So, the one who called the council and convened the council at Ephesus was not the pope, but rather the emperor Theodosius II. More than that, the emperor's synodal letter to all of the metropolitans forbid any new decisions to be made by anyone whatsoever. If you, if you wish a citation for this, I can cite you Manzi, Volume 4, Columns 1111 to 1116, or 1111 to 1116. For a little background, Manzi, of course, is the well-known multi-volume, uh, uh, enormous <laughs> set of the Greek and Latin texts of the Acts of the Ecumenical Councils. Now, the presidency of the council uh, was, it was of course presided over by St. Cyril of Alexandria. That is unquestionable. Now, the thing that we learned last time is that Cyril essentially acted as the legate for Pope Celestine. So, which is true in one sense and false in another sense. Allow me to explain this. It is unquestionable that Arcadius, Projectus, and Philip, who was a presbyter, were Celestine's main legates at Ephesus. This is made clear in the Synod's letter to Pope Celestine. They said, For there were sitting with us the most reverend bishops, Arcadius and Projectus, and with them the most holy presbyter Philip, all of whom, so they're writing to Celestine, all of whom were sent by your holiness, who gave to us your presence, and filled the place of the apostolic see. In the Greek there is, Tes apostolikes cathedras. So these, so Arcadius, Projectus, and Philip were legates for Celestine. But, and they were also, of course, in the list of the bishop's signatures in Manzi, Volume 4, 1303, is where you can see the list of those bishops. And Arcadius and Projectus are the only ones who are given the term legatus, legates, in Latin. Now, it is to be observed, um, it is very important here that it, it is true indeed that saint cyril of alexandria was the one who presided over the council and represented and was one of the representatives of pope celestine this is clear from what we uh read earlier where celestine speaking to cyril's uh appropriates his authority to cyril now in considering this and i'm quoting edward denny here his book on papalism he says and page 141 edward denny says quote now in considering this question it is to be observed that in the absence of the bishop of the first c in rank at a council which had to investigate charges against the bishop of the second C in rank, that is Constantinople, of whom Nestorius was patriarch, the office of president would naturally fall to the bishop of Alexandria. So basically uh, what he is saying <clears throat> is that uh, since obviously the patriarch of Constantinople, Nestorius, was the one being examined, and since uh, Rome, which obviously was not viewed as the uh, ultimate authority, but nonetheless was very much a prominent uh, diocese and see within church history, especially in the first few centuries. Um, and since Celestine was absent and Nestorius was the one being examined, the office of president, as, De as Denny says, would naturally fall to the Bishop of Alexandria, who of course is St. Cyril. Now, and it also, in the letter of the Council of Ephesus to Theodosius II, seems to say that Cyril was representing Alexandria at the council. So, this is basically um, the reason why Cyril was the uh, president of the council was not simply because he represented Rome, but because he represented both Rome and Alexandria. He was representing two of the most prominent sees in the Christ in Christendom at once at a council. This is similar. Cyril's relationship to Celestine at this council is similar to how Flavian of Philippi presided in the place of Rufus of Thessalonica. For a citation for this and for more exploration in the subject, I Cite Manzi, Volume 2, Column 1224. Manzi 2, 1224. Now, the next thing that we should examine is the overall attitude of the Council concerning um, Nestorius and Celestine. Now, one thing that's interesting is the Council still examined Nestorius despite the fact, and they even invited him to take his seat amongst the other bishops. If you read the Acts of Ephesus, the Council of Ephesus is translated by Father Richard Price. And this is in... in uh, spite of the fact that Celestine's 10-day chance given to Nestorius to repent of his heresy had already expired, and this shows that they did not view Pope Celestine as being the final authority in the controversy. Secondly, at the council, Cyril's second letter to Nestorius was examined, and only after it had been examined to see if it agreed with the Nicaea was it approved. And of course, at one point they say, the Nicene Creed and the letter of Cyril in all things agree and harmonize. 
This is in spite of the fact that Pope Celestine had already approved of Cyril's uh, views and actions, as can be seen by his correspondence with the aforementioned St. Cyril. Even Charles Hefela, who is a Roman Catholic church historian, describes in detail the examination of Nestorius and the counts at the council, and he says, quote, in order, however, to submit the doctrinal point in question to a thorough investigation, and in the light of patristic testimony at the suggestion of Flavian, Bishop of Philippi, a number of passages from the writings of the fathers of the church were expressed in which the ancient faith respecting the union of the Godhead and manhood in Christ was expressed. So he, they say that the doctrinal point, namely the hypostatic union of Christ and whether or not he was one or two persons, was, he says he was put to a thorough investigation. Now, the fact that such a, quote, thorough investigation took place, even though Celestine had already given his judgment on the matter, shows once again that the bishops of Ephesus didn't view the Roman bishop as the final arbiter in controversies and schisms within the church. And by the way, I should mention that the citation that I quoted from Hephala is found in History of the Councils of the Church, Volume 3, page 48. The last thing that we should examine is a part in the decree of the council where it's... Um, where they speak of, where the bishops of Ephesus speak of being compelled by uh, the letters and the canons of Celestine. So one thing that, there's a couple things which should be noted here, and this is of course cited by Eric Ibarra. Um, and so the fact that they say that uh, the bishops were compelled by Celestine's letter shows that they viewed him as the final authority. That's that's the claim. Now, there's there's some problems with this. There's two main ones, which I will mention here before we wrap up. One is that the canons, which is likely a reference to Canon 74 of the Apostolic Canons, and Celestine's letter are mentioned in the same sentence. They're mentioned in the same breath, which is more significant than I think we might realize at first glance. So this implies that Celestine and the canons that they refer to are on equal footing since both of them compel. And some have uh, suggested translating the Greek word katepechthentes, katepechthentes, I should say, as meaning to urge or to press hard rather than compel. However, I don't think the translation, this translation would affect the overall meaning of the passage, so I'm not uh, making a big claim about that. So, since, so both the canons that it references, which, like I said before, is probably referenced to some of the apostolic canons, both the canons and Celestine's letter compel the bishops. They both compel the Council of Ephesus, not just the Bishop of Rome, and they're mentioned in the same sentence. And so, and so that that shows that this is um, that they're on the same footing, because and not only that, but it mentions the canons first, compelled to there by the canons and by the letter of Celestine, the Roman Bishop, our Holy Father and fellow servant. And that, of course, brings us to the next issue, which is the fact that some have appealed to the fact that it refers to Celestine as the Holy Father as proof that uh, this is. They had a very high view of the Bishop of Rome, such as Vatican I would have taught. However, the title Holy Father is also applied to Cyril of Alexandria and others. Though whether or not you know Roman Catholic apologists would use this as their main argument is another issue. Um, in Manzi, Volume 6, Column 1055, this title Holy Father is applied to St. Cyril. So those are the main aspects of the debate concerning the Council of Ephesus and the papacy. And while it is true, indeed, that Celestine had a pivotal role in this, he, ult it ultimately, he was ultimately not the final arbiter in this controversy. Rather, it was the council as a whole and also looking to St. Cyril, who is representing both Rome and Alexandria at the same time, and that is why he had the presidency of the council, not simply because he was representing Celestine, the Bishop of Rome. And that concludes our lecture for this time. And I uh, pray that the Lord is blessed to you and... Uh, will help us to better investigate these issues and hopefully counteract many of the claims that we are hearing around on the internet concerning Roman Catholic, by Roman Catholic apologists about church history and, and the church's relationship to the Bishop of Rome throughout the history of the Christian church.